All right. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good feedback. Um, welcome to GSV Labs and welcome to Demo Day. Uh, my name is Kate Newton. I am the center director here at our headquarter, GSV Labs, um, in Silicon Valley. And we're so excited to have you all here. Um, we have eight exciting um, early stage companies that are gonna be pitching for you about three, four minutes each. Um, and then we'll have a nice networking session after so that you can get to know those companies a little bit more, um, grab a drink and hang out with us a little bit. So um, just to kick this off, I wanna give a shout out to Kaiset, um, the Korea Institute of Startup Entrepreneurship and Development. Um, a few of the companies you're gonna, you're gonna see today, about three of them, um, have come out of our most recent accelerator program with Kaiset. Um, we've been accelerating companies with them for about three years now um, and worked with over 50 early stage companies. Um, so we're certainly excited to showcase you know, those most recent companies and continue the partnership with them. The rest of the companies you're gonna see tonight are curated um, from the GSC Labs community and our broader GSC Labs network um, to have a really kind of diverse um, across verticals and so what I want to show you here is we've been doing demo days for quite some time now, um, and we've had some, some highs, some success points. Um, three of them are showcased right here. One is Novel Effect. Um, they've gone on to raise money um, from Maveron, uh, Lux Ventures, and they are featured on Shark Tank. Um, we also have Jetpack, which is one of our, our stand-up ed tech companies. Uh, they went on to raise money from uh, Ref, um, let's see, Ref Draft VC um, and the Dorm Room Fund, um, and also BitOps, which uh, raised a fund recently um, led by Illuminate VC. So uh, before we get started, if you aren't so familiar with GSE Labs and what we do, or you are familiar but not sure um, what we've been up to lately, I wanna give you a quick overview. Uh, GSE Labs stands for Global Silicon Valley. And we are a global innovation platform working to connect um, all the pieces of the innovation economy in one space. Um, and so what that means for us um, is that we support entrepreneurs, accelerate startups, and connect corporations to exponential technologies, business models, and ideas um, that have historically made Silicon Valley such a special place. We think about Silicon Valley as not a place but a mindset um, and really um, an innovative landscape which has led to some of the most disruptive ideas um, and where anyone can kind of make amazing things happen. And so we work to really connect that mindset uh, to the rest of the world and the world to that mindset. So we work with uh, startups in a few different ways. Um, not only startups, but we work with investors, uh, mentors, corporates, kind of all of those pieces. Um, and we have a few different ways that we do that. We have two innovation centers. Uh, we support about 200 startups across two locations, one here and one in Boston. Um, but we are expanding our global footprint. Um, and in one of those ways is we recently launched a digital platform called GSV Passport. Um, and so startups, not only in our physical innovation centers, but also around the world, uh, can now tap into our resources with an online membership. This includes connections to investment, um, about 500 investors tap into our community for deal flow, um, about 150 mentor program, um, over $500,000 in discounts and services that startups have access to. Um, and we launched this in January of this year. We've added about 1,000 startups across 20 different countries. Um, so if you haven't yet, I encourage you um, to go check this out. Uh, here's a little bit of a feature for you, it's available on mobile. <laughs> And through this, um, we are really expanding that message and expanding um, that mindset to, to connect with everyone. Um, I, a little bit of piece of news right now, we have recently become the national organizer uh, for the Entrepreneurship World Cup. Um, this is available to, to all companies at any stage um, to go pitch and win a chance at $500 million in prizes. Um, so if you're interested in this, please find a member of our staff after um, and we'll tell you all about it. And without further ado, I wanna go ahead and bring up the first company you'll be hearing from. Um, it's called Voca, and I'll be bringing up uh, Rika Ko, um, who is the CEO and founder. Hi everyone, it's Ruka, but it was close. My sister's name is Rika, actually. Um, okay, hi everyone, um, happy to be here. Um, the first thing I wanna do is get like a feel for the room. So how many of us have used like a conversational interface? So that's like Alexa, Siri, IVRs. 
Okay, a lot of hands go up. Um, it's not really that surprising because, oh, that's us. Um, is there, where are you guys seeing the slide? Oh, right there, okay. Um, not super surprising because um, between 2018 and 2019, there was like a 39.8% growth in the adoption of smart speakers, which is right, just a subset of all conversational interfaces. So most of us know what it's like to use one of these systems. But today, I wanna pull back the curtains a bit on the people that bring life to these interactions, and they are conversation designers. So conversation designers have this cool task of making these systems fun, useful, engaging, um, natural, right? Um, and they work across different industries, across different systems. Um, and so, yeah, they have this really important task. And um, it's really important because as humans, right, like language is evolutionarily derived. So we like are born knowing how to speak. Um, and so they have this cool task of bringing up the level of these interactions to meet us where we already are. Um, and so I think that's pretty cool. That's where everything is headed. Um, but there's a huge problem in that they don't have the tools to do their work. Um, and we got a lot of feedback that even internal tools aren't really cutting it. So way at the beginning, we interviewed hundreds of conversation designers and we asked them, okay, well, what tools are you guys using? And you'll notice that of the top five, four of them are Excel, Word, Google Docs, Google Sheets. Um, and you might be thinking, okay, well, everybody uses those things, but it's a little bit different when you have 700 rows going up and down of content, right, 50 columns going left and right. Um, and conversation has a lot of variance, but underlyingly, it's quite systematic. Um, and so they utilize their knowledge of that to build out their conversation map, so to speak. And they do that using a diagramming tool. Um, and then to tie these two things together, they'll put together like a 200 page Word document. So it's really a lot. And design is very iterative. So if tomorrow or next week you have to go and make one change even, you have to go and touch every single one of these documents. And you're lucky if you have three. Most conversation designers say that they have four, five, six, seven pieces of documentation, which is quite a lot. Um, and if you're testing and there's a bug in the code, it's because maybe the developer was looking at the spreadsheet from yesterday, the diagram from last week, and the Word document from last month. So there are a lot of problems. Um, multiple applications makes it really hard to iterate. You know, when there's seven pieces of 100 page documents, it's really hard to hand off to anybody. Um, version problems, right? So there are a lot of problems, um, and it all culminates in being a lot of wasted time, and it's very human. Um, uh, error prone and very manual. So given all that context, what we're doing with Voca is actually quite simple, which is to build a design tool specifically for our conversation designers. Um, and it's clear that the Word documents and the diagramming tools aren't really cutting it. Um, there are some tools that have cropped up in the space, right, because conversational interfaces are starting to um, you know, become really important. But the problem with them is that either one, they're too focused on the code output, which um, ultimately infringes on the rights of the designer, right? Because to make a really good conversational interface, you need a really great designer. And if you're focusing too much on the code, you're really taking away from what the designer needs. Um, and if the designer's not using it, then like what does the developer care what tool they're using, right? Um, and then the other thing is that the tools are too um, narrow. So the conversations that you can make with those existing tools are too, um, are too simple. And as more and more people adopt these tools, we're gonna expect that more of these interfaces um, or these interactions are more compli complicated, sophisticated, and so those tools really aren't you know, giving the designers that space to be able to do that nuanced work. Um, so this is our working MVP um, from like last month and a half. It's very gray, but um, it provides simple and sleek diagramming, um, gives the features that you want no more, no less, and it allows you to link system um, logic to the system prompting, so it cuts away the need for like multiple pieces of documentation. And it is a web application which allows for easy collaboration. Um, and so when we released our working MVP like, uh, yeah, like about two months ago now, um, we reached back out to the conversation designers that signed up to use our tool. And one of the first things we asked them to do is okay, let's make the exact same design change once using your existing workflow and once using our tool. So let's call that design change like one unit of a design change. So we had everybody do the exact same thing. And I'll put up the results from three of the conversation designers. So one working at Uber, one for Sprint, one for eBay. And you'll notice that the difference is literally like minutes to seconds. Um, and given that an average conversation designer in the San Francisco Bay Area, let's just say, like starting out makes around 90K, that's about how much money they're saving to make that one single design change. Um, so as a conversation designer, the feedback that we got is like it's very compelling because you get to do 
the thing that you want to be doing, which is designing and not babysitting like seven pieces of documentation. Um, but as a company, you stand to save not only time, but money. So we're going for the freemium business model. Um, it's priced this way right now to make it as frictionless as possible for people to transition from what they're currently paying for, which is likely a diagramming application, um, to our tool. But obviously, as the value of our tool surfaces, right, because in the previous slide, like, if $5 is what you're saving for one design change, it doesn't totally make sense to have it priced that way. Like, so we totally understand that. Um, and so as the value surfaces, we're, you know, we're deaf, there's room to tweak these numbers. Um, and... Yeah, so this was our roadmap. Um, back in February, we were actually part of the STEP program, which was affiliated with UC Berkeley. And then at the end of April, we had um, a pitch competition, and we were runner-up out of like 24 startups, I think. Um, and so right now, we're actively learning from our MVP. Um, we're working towards building our beta launch, which is slated to be in September. Um, we're actively, you know, in conversations with with conversations with conversation designers um, to continue to get feedback on our updates. Um, so that's what we're actively working on. And I'm part of a really great team. Um, Mick is my co-founder. She is a software engineer. She has a background in digital technology, innovation, and AI. Jessica is our visual designer, so she helps make our interface nice and user-friendly. Um, I got my degree in linguistics uh, from Berkeley. Um, I was a conversation designer for quite a few companies, big and small, and like everywhere I went, people were complaining about the exact same thing, and so we decided to come together and build this tool um, ourselves. So, yep, that's what we're up to. Um, I'm really excited, thanks for inviting us. Um, we're really excited to be here. I do have to run a little bit early because today's my sister's surprise party. But um, <laughs> but please uh, take a photo, reach out. I would love to get feedback, answer any questions, and talk to um, whoever. We are actively um, speaking to pre-seed or angel investors so that we can help accelerate our progress towards our beta launch. So um, yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we are excited now to bring up TriCatch Media. Um, and this is Ray Yu, who is the founder and CEO. Uh, hi, I'm Ray from Trikachi Media. Uh, I'm a coding expert and university professor. Uh, during my coding journey, uh, I've been about co around 40 years, and I've seen so many people starting to learn coding. First of all, coding is a seemingly difficult for new learners, and Maybe books and video lectures are usually steep and boring. And second, especially it, it is very hard to study alone without expert or seasoned teachers. To overcome this problem, uh, I developed a video game that users can play and uh, finally, users can run sufficient foreign language and algorithm. And users also can code with uh, CodeBot, our AI bot. So user can uh, not alone. With the CodeBot, user can stay with their friend CodeBot. Uh, there are also competitors. Coding camps are quite popular, and but it's less accessible. Also, some company providing games, but it is only focusing on playing, not making. I'd like to uh, look. Uh, I'd like to see about some advantages. User can create their own labels and share it online with their friend. Also, user can run some advanced curriculum through our interactive content. Not to mention, user can compete and collaborate with each other. To market opportunity. There are 21 countries where coding is mandatory in K-12, including Korea and Japan. And over 84% parents con consider coding is crucial for their kid. Our revenue model is three main streams, uh, with B2B2C, with our 
education portal, uh, and, and also B2C model, we directly target users uh, uh, two weeks uh, for free, and after two weeks, you just have to pay monthly subscription. And current tra 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 traction, uh, we already funded by uh, some angel investors, and one it is one million dollars, and we have. Uh, 4,200 users now, and 82% uh, percent users are satisfied, satisfied with the dry coding. And gross plan, uh, we are going to launch a commercial version this July, and subsequently, uh, North America, uh, and East Asia, South America, and South Asia, and Europe. Uh, we are looking forward to, to raise uh, 3 million seed around in Q3 to uh, find uh, to fund uh, 18 months of growth and we are going to launch uh, 16 countries. Yeah, for team, uh, I am a CEO and CTO of my company and we have uh, six more persons, uh, all are developers and UX designers. Thank you, thank you. Up next is Inventurist, and we're excited to welcome Sirius Shakiri up, who is the founder and CEO. Thank you, Kate. Is this working? Hi, everyone. My name is Sirius Shakiri, CEO, founder of Inventurist. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, GSV Labs, Kate, Ishan, for the opportunity. Uh, so Inventurist, uh, it's a startup that focusing on uh, big companies, big enterprises. Uh, I'm here with my co-founder, Gil, who is sitting in the back. Uh, our third uh, co-founder, Andre, is in Slovakia. That's where we have our engineering team. The problem that we are addressing at Inventories is the problem of big companies bringing new products to market. And these are the type of products that, for example, automotive, aerospace, uh, semiconductor companies uh, have. These are uh, big investments and capital in intensive, uh, basically, processes. And uh, these companies get into the uh, sort of uh, catch-22 situation, meaning that they cannot stop building and inventing new products because then they will be outcompeted. But when they get into investing, they have to put a lot of money, it's almost like a big bet that they have to make. And all that investment is on, on the line, whether that product will be successful or not, and they, they have to fight with this one to 3,000 odd of success for a new product to get to the market. And for that reason, uh, what companies do is going through this gated process, which in, if you are familiar with these sort of processes, is, is very gated. So they have to go to very rigorous decision making to make sure that the money that they are putting into these new products, cars, airplanes, so on and so forth, is uh, returning their investment. It's a long uh, process and um, the, the time to market, not losing to the competitor, not having recalls as you are hearing about like cars, for example. These are all the real pain points at, that are going on in these uh, big companies. The, the opportunity for uh, ultimately uh, uh, solving this catch-22 problem is, in our opinion, in the big data and the collective intelligence that is in the big data. So that the answer to the questions of like, what is the business model that is emerging uh, for our new products? Who would be our customers? What would be the features of the product and the pricing? It's almost out there. We just need to find a way to extract these information and put it in the hands of the decision makers that are building these products. So that's the opportunity that we have taken and build this uh, AI machine that automatically extract those information from big data and puts it in the, in the hand of, again, those decision makers to make the process 
faster and more um, uh, basically predictable. It's almost like we have built um, a GPS system that looks at all the information that is out there and maps a path for these companies to start from ideas to the product that gets to the market. The product exists. This is real product. Uh, we have been on this for, uh, for a while. And um, the uh, screenshots that you see on the, on the, on the projector here are um, dashboards that help these decision makers to make those decisions about the customer segment, the value proposition, uh, features, pricing, partners, and everything that they have to do in these NPI processes. Uh, this is um, in contrast to what enterprise uh, software you might hear um, from, the, from the existing generation of BI, which is business intelligence, because it takes companies from looking at, uh, let's say, some results of analysis to actions. So it, it's, it's almost like that analogy of uh, a, a GPS system for such companies. Uh, we have customers. Uh, we currently have eight pilots going on with Fortune 500 companies. These are, again, uh, large companies. Uh, two paying customers with uh, multiple engagement. And we have received uh, good um, testimonial from, uh, from some of them. Um, Oops, if I could go back. And uh, the plan for us in terms of customer traction is to have, um, let's say, up to five big customers on, uh, until the end of the year and serve them, serve them really well before we get into uh, scaling the product. In terms of the market uh, and the size of the market that we are um, addressing, it's a $34 billion uh, consulting uh, especially a strategy consulting, product strategy consulting that big companies like McKinsey and then uh, there is a range of like uh, small and medium sized companies do to provide that help for decision making to uh, let's say automotive aerospace companies. And uh, th these are processes that are very labor intensive and time consuming and it's actually part of a bigger trend you might have heard that many of the low-level information processing that uh, services like consulting services provide are shifting toward AI. And that's the part of uh, the trend that we want to be part of. The team um, is six of us. Uh, again, the engineering team is, is going to be built and extended in Slovakia, which is in Central Europe. We have access to uh, AI machine learning talent in that part of the world. Uh, we are from uh, SAP and Ericsson and big companies, as well as we have uh, built startups and work for small, medium-sized uh, companies. We also have development partners in, uh, in India and, um, and offshore, um, basically, development. Um, we have partnership, obviously, with GSV Labs. We are on uh, GSV uh, Passport Marketplace. Please check us out there. Uh, we also provide the discount. And uh, we have built full stack our uh, enterprise uh, grade um, software uh, in terms of uh, the SaaS model on Google Cloud. And we are official Google Cloud technology partner. Recently also uh, got into the Intel AI program for getting their support in terms of engineering and marketing support. Uh, the um, upside for what we are doing is huge in the sense that uh, when we build this uh, uh, assistant that would help these decision makers to decide what product to build and for which market, then the stickiness of this platform comes from the fact that we can serve other functions in the ent enterprise, from sales and marketing to business development and corporate strategy. We are here to ask for support in terms of connecting to the type of companies that we are targeting. Again, uh, large companies that have complex products, automotive, aerospace, semiconductor, uh, consumer electronics, as well as a strategic partnership in terms of channels and uh, an investment. Thank you very much for uh, being here. We have a booth and we can explain more details and show you a demo of the platform. Thank you very much.
All right. Up next is Reverti. Um, and I'd like to welcome H.S. Lee to the stage. Ooh. So many people get us um, nervous, but uh, I will do. Hi, we are Liberty. We are gaining education and investment. Lack of financial literacy hurt people's chance, chance to succeed in life. To solve this, Liberty has created RPG, role-playing game, to teach kids financial concepts. Today, many kids, many kids spend hours playing games. Unfortunately, most game is violent, violent and have not value except only entertainment. Our game give our game our kids financial gaming financial economic value concept. Uh, there are six. There are six levels in our game, and uh, in each level, uh, there are some, there are some stage, and this this uh, this level is uh, uh, consists of history of human economic development, and it is fit into the growth children, and the next. Next level of our game, it contained the value of the concept of mortgage, investment account, stock, and bond. Most game takes only their your money, but our game is educational game and investment game. In our game, uh, if you purchase some item, that item could be real asset and account. Total addressable market of our item gonna be 42, more 42 billion dollars. But in gaming, gaming buying investment is untapped market. So we don't know how, how huge it is. Another virtual game in the real world, Pokemon Go, their revenue until now is more than two billion dollars. Our game is another type of virtual reality, I think. In first, uh, educational game will launch in App Store and Google Play, and next will cooperate with uh, brokerage, brokerage bank, uh, like like. Uh, Goldman Sachs, and and next step will offer SaaS as a SaaS to school. We are looking for angel round, and if we success in angel round fundraising, we can take a matching fund from South Korea government. This is our team. Uh, I, I am, and we consist of CTO, uh, C# -sharp developer, and designer, and and uh, tr trader. Yes, this is Liberty. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, we have Pop Fizz. Um, and please welcome Jane Lee to the stage. She is the founder and CEO. Hello, everybody. My name is Jane Lee. I'm the CEO and co-founder of PopViz. So uh, in the past 12 years of my career, I have worked with teachers and faculty, helping them to use technology to uh, enhance student learning. In the past few years, I worked with hundreds of teachers around the world, training them to teach computer science. And let me tell you, K-12 CS education is broken. Yes, it is. <laughs> well, software is eating the world, and it's not waiting for us. And as you may know, um, there was a big frenzy that shook up the nation. Uh, Amazon HQ2, uh, 
the headquarters, um, you know, we had states competing against each other to host it, right? And uh, it was a wake-up call for many, many states and people. And because computer science is critical to every aspect of the economy, and we need to be fostering the next uh, workforce to be able to work with technology fluently. And this is very urgent. However, less than a third of the schools um, offer this course. Even with government funding being prioritized in CS education and um, the IT industry pouring in money, uh, the schools are not able to uh, find a solution because recruiting teacher is very tough. And in order to provide at least one basic course at a school, 30,000 teachers need to be trained. Yes, and because these teachers are so rare, uh, too many students are being crammed into a lab. And a teacher that we're working with in San Ramon County, uh, he has 38 students in his class, and he teaches five sections. So that's a little less than 200, and he manages two other CS teachers. When you have an environment like that, there is no personalized learning, and your retention and engagement suffers. And of course, teachers are overburdened. Um, they spend over half of their time grading student projects. And we are here to offer a solution. We are enabling the CS teachers. And how do we do that? Well, there are three things that sets us apart. So we provide auto grader that takes the pain away from grading. And uh, our teachers um, have stated that they have uh, reduced their grading time by 90%. And also, they get to get detailed reports and track student progress real time so that you know, when they discover at-risk students, they can intervene right away. And uh, we provide course in a box model. Oh, the image is not loading. However, um, if it was loading, you should see uh, the course pathway from middle to high school. There should be about nine courses there. And uh, so we provide full curriculum online and schools who would like to run their courses can adopt it and uh, have it happen within a month. And also we provide individual learning pathways and we not only deal with coding, but we also empower students by covering physical computing where students are working with circuit boards, uh, robots to interact with the world. And we not only want to grow with our students, we want our teachers to improve too. So we're providing ongoing professional development seminars and uh, the schools can save thousands of dollars because they currently pay about 2,500 per teacher. We're offering uh, PD at uh, one eighth of the cost, which is 350. And uh, this trend of um, demand for computer science education, it's not a fad, it's not gonna go away. And the evidence is everywhere. The number of students taking AP CS exam is growing at a very fast rate. And the government budget for computer science education is being prioritized. And the total addressable market at this point, just counting the schools, it's about uh, 350 million. However, with more and more states committing, they're mandating computer science. Um, around 2025, it'll be 1.2 billion. And this is our business model. Uh, we have a freemium model, and uh, the small schools can pay 350 a year uh, for a class. And also, the schools can pay 2,500 uh, for the whole year and get unlimited access. So we've launched our product uh, last year, September, and since then, we have about 2,500 users and over 100 classrooms that are using us actively. And we have external partners that are working with us. Uh, we are partnering with Stanford and UC Irvine with their Gifted and Talented stu uh, Students program. And also, um, I'm very much aware of the gender ratio uh, that's really off in the tech world for women. Um, there's one woman for four boys in classroom right now. And uh, so we're partnering with Chick Tech and McAfee to address that. Uh, we are also a recommended resource provider listed, <coughs> excuse me, listed at co.org and College Board. So this is our team. There's myself and my CTO over there uh, who has about 12 years of experience as a lead developer. And uh, we have award-winning teachers that are developing the curriculum with us. And we're currently raising a pre-seed round of 500K. We have secured 100K, and we're also negotiating uh, 250K right now. And we would like to get introductions to investors and uh, schools. Thank you. Let's make real impact. All right, next up we have YGO. 
uh, CEO of Voixatch. Hello everyone, my name is YZ, uh, CEO of Voisage. Before introducing our product, I want to share the concept with you first. Have you, have you wanted to go out without uh, your smartphone, but you, you wanna still make a call continually? Or have you ever been without your Bluetooth headset, but if you, but, uh, have you, have you, have you, uh, sorry, this is uh, my first language, sorry. <coughs> or uh, have you been out with a Bluetooth headset, but make it cool? So what we bring here today is the first smart touch with a built-in Bluetooth headset. That's VoiceArch. VoiceArch is a voice-based smartwatch with a cellular or Bluetooth Wi-Fi mode and what makes us is unique is there is a detachable bezel Bluetooth headset. As you can see on the screen or on my hands, when you got a call, just detach your bezel, put the side button on your ear, then you can use this one as an ear set because in the bezel there is a microphone and speakers. With these pictures, you don't need to carry or recharge your Bluetooth headset separately. And also if you want, you can change the design, whatever you want, just through exchange the bezel. This is the uh, market size, and uh, without market readers one, there's a still huge numbers. We strongly believe that there's a, a lot of users who want to use our product because we have a great merit. With them, we can jump into the market safely. We want to run, we want to launch our product in the Kickstarter and Indiegogo three quarter of these years. And if we are also looking for the investment, 200, which is $250,000, and then we'll be qualified for matching fund from our government, which is $500,000. With that money, we'll make a really great promotional content and be ready to produce in mass. The minimum goal of this crowdfunding sales is over 1,000 units, which is uh, around a million dollars. Why do we think uh, this, crowd, this crowdfunding will be successful? As you can see on the screen, we pre-launched our product in Barcelona and the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona in this year. So many buyers, distributors, medias uh, loved our product and they gave us great feedback. Now we are smart touch with the detachable bezel ear set, but we put more functions and design into the bezel than like uh, uh, such as voice search for WeChat or voice search for the in, the in sorry, uh, visually impaired people. <coughs> and then we can uh, expand our market sharply, I believe. Uh, sorry about the uh, skip the uh, t interesting team. We have uh, six members, three uh, developers, including me, and there are the three marketers. And also we have uh, uh, partner, uh, partners in China, Sanjon, and then there is our uh, producing factory, main factory. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, up next we have Standard C, and um, please welcome Robert. get out to all of you, but I'll try and do this with the mic. Uh, standard C, is it up, oh, there it is. Okay, it's up there. Uh, I wanna start off by just asking you a couple quick questions. 
Uh, how many of you can identify the fastest growing new industry with no access to financial services? Oh, you can. Just one? The cannabis industry, we're going to talk about mar it's marijuana, <laughs> has some interesting facts around it. Uh, one is the legal cannabis industry now is running at about $22 billion a year. The illegal cannabis in the United States industry is running about $100 billion a year. <laughs> and that's what makes it tough uh, for banking. So you have a $22 billion industry without access to financial services. 80% of the market is still illegal. And they have very complex corporate structures. There tend to be a lot of LLCs and very complicated, and banks just say, wait, that's way too complicated. Uh, and also, another question, how many state agencies in California do you think regulate cannabis? One, 10, zero, 17. 17 state agencies, and every city and county that has a cannabis operation also has regulations. So it's really a challenging uh, problem. Well, we've solved that problem. We've solved that problem with one unified software solution. And we had four constituents that were very hard to please. One was financial institutions. How many of you are out of banking? OK, a couple of folks, All right? So in banking, of course, you have to know your customer. The problem with cannabis, especially B2B cannabis, is the counterparty, the other party, is unknown to the bank. So funds flowing into the bank are pro could be illegal. In fact, there's an 80% chance they are because of the market. And funds flowing out in B2B could be going to an illegal counterparty. So we've solved that problem. Tax regulators, has anyone heard the statistics on cannabis tax in California? The, the, what was that? So the rate is about 35%. The actual collections last year were about 40% of what was anticipated because of revenue diversion. So we've also solved that problem for tax authorities. And finally, for the cannabis industry, being completely cash dependent is very expensive and dangerous. And so we, t we basically take the cash out of cannabis. And what's unique about our software is that we do what we call counterparty testing. Right now, at a bank, if they get a suspicious transaction, they analyze that after the transaction and do a report. <laughs> what we do is we look at the transaction that's about to be made. We analyze it to see if it, if it looks right in terms of not being money laundering, that the parties are both legal. And then we transmit instructions to the bank that the transaction is probably safe. Okay. We also verify their license. So that's, that's what's different about what we do. And, and from discussion with several banks, no one is doing anything like this. Uh, we've already talked about the tax regulators. We help collect the taxes. We help pay the taxes. We make sure that's all recorded in a uh, distributed ledger. Everyone knows distributed ledger is the same thing as blockchain, right? OK. Except people call it DLT now instead of blockchain. We, <laughs> we help uh, all these businesses gain access to banking. Right now, the cost of carrying cash for a cannabis industry is around 10 to 20% of operating expenses. Armored cars, uh, security guards, theft, et cetera. Uh, we get rid of that. Uh, and our business model is really simple. We charge a percentage of every transaction. So every single transaction, we have a fee, and that's much less than the cost of handling the cash. So it's a fairly straightforward uh, program. Uh, and you know, most importantly, uh, we have a great team. We're all a little old. Most of us are a little older than most startups. But we've been around. We, we had a good education. We've worked in big companies that were highly regulated. And uh, we put this together. And today is the first day that we've ever talked about this in public. And in terms of, <laughs> that's right. In terms of funding, uh, we funded this ourselves at first. And then we uh, just 
finished a nice seed round, uh, I think last week. So we're not raising money today. We will be raising money uh, towards the end of the year after we've completed our testing. And we're testing with about eight customers and uh, a few banks in, in Northern California now. So we'll report on that a little later. And that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, last but certainly not least, we have North Loop. Please welcome Tehem Verma to the stage. He's the CEO. Can you hear me? Cool. Which button? Okay, I'll figure it out. Hi, thanks so much for being here. I'm Thaim, I'm the co-founder and CEO of North Loop. North Loop is banking for global citizens. So just a little bit about me. I first came to the US when I was 18. I came to Philly. Opening a bank account, opening a bank account was a fairly difficult process for me. And then more importantly, the banking experience itself was completely broken for someone like me. After that, I moved to India, where I once again had to open a bank account. And then five years later, I came back to the US. And once again, I went through the exact same problems all over again. The end result of this? I had seven accounts across two countries by the time I was 28. Every time I moved, I had to open a new account. I had absolutely no credit history, and I had no opportunity to build that credit history. And in essence, I was a financial nomad. I was being pushed to the edges of the financial system. And you know, I'm not the only person who goes through this problem. Anyone who moves across the world for work or for education experiences a broken banking system. If you're an expat, if you're an immigrant or if you're an international student, you have to open an account every single time you move. You have a lot of exposure to FX volatility and a lot of issues with cross-border payments. And most importantly, you really struggle with accessing fairly priced credit and debt. And so this got me thinking. It's 2019, the world is completely flattened. If you're in India or if you're in New York, you're experiencing the same products, the same content, the same experiences. The only industry that this does not apply to is the financial services industry. And we're going to change that with North Loop. So we're creating a global unified banking platform that no matter where you are, you get access to our services. Over 3% of the world's population lives outside their country of birth. That's over 250 million people. How we look at that is we're targeting 48 million of these global citizens. If we capture only 15% of that market, that's over 7 million people with an addressable revenue of over $5 billion. In our first phase, we're going to be targeting international students when they come to the US. So international students go through the exact same problems I mentioned, except they start at a much earlier age. They're future global citizens. They're a high earning and affluent demographic. They spend over $35,000 a year just in college itself. And most importantly, this is a really unique opportunity. This is a lifelong customer that you can acquire at that one moment in their lives where they do not have a banking account. And they converge in the US during this one moment. And so when you're building a global product, you have this access to these users right here. So we're the first digital bank for international students in the US. We provide an FDIC insured checking account and a Visa debit card for all students. They do not need a social security number to sign up, which you no longer get if you're an international student. And you can sign up for the account before you come to the US so that the debit card is waiting for you on your first day. You don't need to visit a branch. And it's a completely digital experience, which is a first experience for all these international students. We're building a borderless account, so this means that we're removing the friction of transferring money from your home country to the US. This means no wire fees, instant wire transfers, FX protection. We're also providing you payment plans to help you ease the burden of paying for college. We've got a really great unique acquisition strategy. So the first is that it's cost effective. We're acquiring these users before they even have a bank account. It's efficient. Our, pa our partners promote us across the world and give us access to their students. And it's effective. We're we're creating products that they need on a daily basis, so they use us on a daily basis. Some of our partners include the Department of State and Navitas Education, and they give us access to over 150,000 incoming international students this year itself. So we're launching end of July. We've got some really exciting metrics we'd like to share with you. The first is we opened up our wait list, and we have over 15,000 people signed up for it. The second is that we are, have over two and a half million dollars of pre-qualified education loans people have applied for. And I think, for me at least, what's the most exciting is that we are on track to hit $120,000 of recurring revenue before we actually even launch for the month of July. So there's myself, I'm a former founder. I founded Nguru, which is an ed tech startup. We hit over a million weekly active users. 
And my co-founder, Gaurav, is the CTO. He's actually built multiple digital bank banking solutions before when he was at McKinsey. We're raising a seed round of one and a half million. Thank you. We're North Loop. Thank you so much. How about another big round of applause to all our companies that just presented? <laughs> all right. Thank you so much for coming. We hope you stay. We have um, the bar did not disappear. It has simply been moved around the corner. <laughs> um, so we have food. We have snacks. We have demo tables. Um, we have signs if you just take a right um, in our area just right out there. So thanks so much for coming.